Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Cleveland Clinic CEO and President, Dr. Tom Mahaljevic. Good evening and thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Mindy Grossman grew up in Valley Stream, New York. Her father was in a wholesale produce business and her mother was a homemaker. In 1977, she launched herself into the New York fashion world. She worked with designers like Jeffrey Banks and Willis Smith and took polo jeans from an idea to $450 million business. As an executive at Nike, she helped transform it from a shoe company to a global apparel brand. And as a CEO of Home Shopping Network, she made the network modern and also profitable. All in all, Mindy is one of the most successful business executives of the 21st century. Mindy lives in the New York area with her husband, Neil, and they have a grown daughter, Lizzie. Oprah Winfrey, who visited us as well several years back, calls Mindy a visionary leader who thrives on transformation. Now here's a video to tell you more. She's one of Forbes' top 100 most powerful women, one of Fast Company's most creative people in business, one of Financial Times' top 50 women in world business, and number 22 on Fortune's top people in business. Risk taker, driven by purpose, passion, and impact, begins to define Mindy Grossman. Yet what makes her so incredibly successful runs much deeper than that. In the late 1950s, Donald and Elaine Waldman of Long Island, New York, were unable to have a child of their own. They longed to adopt, but couldn't afford the fee. One night, my father went to work at midnight, and his boss handed my father a check, and it was the money to adopt a child. And because of that, I was told that I was special, that I could do anything I wanted to do. I also felt this deep sense of responsibility because I'd been given this gift. A bright and hardworking student, Mindy Grossman graduated high school early at just 16. At the age of 19, she was a senior at George Washington University and engaged to her high school sweetheart. One morning, she awoke with an undeniable sense she was on the wrong path. I called my folks and I said, I have something to tell you. Um, not getting married, I'm not going to law school, and I'm leaving school right now and I'm moving to New York because I'm gonna figure it out. And that's what I did. Mindy Grossman spent the next 30 years rising through the fashion ranks. She held senior executive roles at Tommy Hilfiger and Ralph Lauren, and launched Polo Jeans Company with overwhelming success as president and CEO. She eventually became global vice president of Nike's apparel business, where she nearly doubled their annual revenue. You've had a very non-linear career path. Not taking a risk is actually more dangerous than taking the intelligent risk. In 2006, Grossman made a surprise move, becoming CEO of IAC Retail, the parent company of the Home Shopping Network. She took the company public as HSNI, offering customers a seamless shopping experience across multiple channels. She transformed HSN into a lifestyle network designed to engage, inform, and entertain, featuring celebrities and entrepreneurs telling the unique stories of their brands. She made HSN.com one of the top 10 trafficked e-commerce sites and drove the value of its stock from $10 to $55 a share. In 2017, Mindy Grossman was named president and CEO of Weight Watchers, and in just one year, she has accelerated the company's evolution to become the world's partner in wellness. On February 7, 2018, Weight Watchers introduced the company's new purpose, to inspire healthy habits for real life, for people, families, communities, the world, for everyone. The brands of the future, the companies of the future, the ones that are going to have sustained momentum are the ones that are really going to bring meaning and purpose to people. The impact has been remarkable. Under Grossman's leadership, the company has seen an increase of about 1 million members in the first year and has reached a record high member retention rate of nine months. Beyond her industry efforts, Mindy Grossman is vice chairman of UNICEF USA, is on the board for Bloomin Brands, Fanatics, and Brooklyn Sports and Entertainment and is committed to creating opportunities for others who too often get overlooked. I am so passionate about diversity as a whole, certainly as a business imperative and a human imperative. More than a successful business leader, Mindy Grossman believes in the ever-changing story of herself and others. She sees opportunity in every challenge and dares all of us to reimagine our own brighter tomorrow.
please welcome Mindy Grossman. Thank you so much. Oh, please. So Mindy, uh, once again, welcome to Cleveland Clinic. And oh, welcome. well, I already had a fantastic day with everyone. It was certainly beyond thought provoking. And we were talking earlier to see such profoundly impactful, not just organization and what you do, but culture um, was incredible. And thank you for having me here. Oh, we, we are absolutely delighted to have you. Just as a disclaimer, when Mindy came here a little bit earlier this afternoon, we packed the agenda. So uh, we instructed her to have comfortable shoes because we just wanted to, to, to share with you as, as much as possible about our campus, but also about our people. And these are my version of comfortable, so it's okay. <laughs> well, I guess coming from a, from a fashion business background, <laughs> those definitions uh, are relatively flexible. You know, what, what I was kind of curious about as I was looking at your uh, biography and everything that you have accomplished, the interesting thing is always that kind of the first decision to abandon the path that was so predictable and uh, seemingly secure. You were excelling academically. You had every, so to say, your, your professional path uh, charted for you. Why, why all of a sudden moving away into the unknown waters, so to say? Yeah, you know, I, I think that because of, and you saw it in the video, I was very fortunate um, to have been adopted and being told every day of my life I could do anything I wanted. But I felt this deep sense of responsibility to do what my family expected of me. I was the first person in my family to go to college. Um, and when growing up on Long Island, my father worked nights in the produce business. And I don't think I even knew what a CEO was, right? If you were going to be professional, you know, you were a doctor, a lawyer, or an accountant. And I'm like, I don't think I'm, I, the doctor thing would work. I definitely don't want to be an accountant. And uh, OK, I'm going to be a lawyer. And it, 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 it kind of evolved from there. And then I, I did get engaged to my college sweetheart, who was going to be a doctor. Um, and so I, I laughed Something that it was, doctors? yeah, no, it was fantastic. But I said, I was living every version of you know, a Jewish mother's dream, right? <laughs> Stereotype. And, uh, but, you know, I, again, I, I was in my, my last semester of college. And the only other thing, when I watched this video, and unfortunately my parents aren't around anymore, but I was like, when that ended, my mother, I'm 60 years old, she was still going to ask me when I was going to finish college. <laughs> uh, but... But I, I, I don't think it was really a one morning epiphany. I mean, it was definitely something. Uh, and I, I, I knew that was not the path that was going to fulfill me wholly. But I almost felt guilty. Like, how can I now go backwards? And finally, I had this revelation that this is the rest of my life. That if I do not make this decision now, it's going to get harder later. Yeah. And I summoned up strength that uh, I now call resilience and said, I have to do this. And so I did make, make that phone call. And the learning from that is not taking the risk is often more risky than taking the risk and course correcting if you need to. And I truly believe that you need to, if you're going to be, if you're going to transform, you have to do it with boldness and you have to be able to take risk. Uh, and so after that, nothing else seemed riskier. Uh, but then I also say that there, you, you really do need to know the difference between risk and suicide, right? You really have to give thought. And, you know, I have my own filter, you know, that I look through um, before I'll, I'll make a decision. You know, am I passionate about it? Is it purposeful? Is it going to take me or the business uh, where it needs to? And will it have impact? Now, how has that filter changed over time? Because you have gone from one position of success to another. Has your filter that you used for your first job evolved any differently for your job number three? So I don't think the, the filter has changed. I think the criteria, right? So passion never changed. 
ever changed. You know, anyone that knows me knows that I have to believe it in my heart and soul, and I have to wake up every morning, and it has to fulfill me, and I have to believe that I can bring as much of myself to it because of how I feel. Is it purposeful? There are things that I'm passionate about, but they're probably not going to give me a successful career or what. Um, so is there a, a purpose behind it at different points of my career? Um, and then will, I, will it have impact? Will it have impact on the business? Will it have impact on human beings? Now, how I looked at my first job or my second job and the impact that I could have is different than today because I'm so fortunate to have a platform where I can have a different type of impact, to use my voice and to use that platform to hopefully impact positively the lives of others. But the other thing that has always stayed the same is the reason I'm successful has nothing to do with my trying to make myself successful. I've had the philosophy from day one that if I do my best to make others successful, I will be more successful and the companies I work for will be more successful. And I will ensure that I'm surrounded by a group of people who are all invested in their own success. And I look through that lens to this day. And that's really what I think has enabled me to create an incredible network of people who can be, will support me and I will support them uh, around the world. You know, it's, as, as I'm listening to you, I think it resonates so powerfully uh, in the work that we do here at the Cleveland Clinic as, uh, as caregivers and health care providers. Uh, we critically depend, depend upon each other to provide the best possible care for our patients. And that culture that I think you so nicely uh, noticed uh, as you kind of came on our campus is something that we're very, very proud of and something that uh, we're very passionate about because every day we make a difference, not necessarily as an individual, although that is obviously also the case, but also as a team. But what prompted you to get into the world of fashion? You know, having this, so to say, criteria about making a difference and uh, getting out there in a the world and taking, taking risk. Was fashion uh, just a coincidence, or, or was, it, uh, was, it, was it, so to say, a plan? Yes and no. Yes and no. When, when I moved to New York, um, so one of the things that was really important to me is I wanted to be in a creative business. Um, you know, I was very interested in the arts. I was very interested in culture. Uh, and I just knew that I might not be the creator, but I wanted to be in the business of making creativity successful. Uh, and I, I, I actually looked at two industries. I looked at the fashion business, and I looked at, at the time, the uh, publishing and editorial business. And you know, I'll never forget, I was interviewing, and the, the job I ended up uh, taking, I was interviewing with the president of an international division of a big menswear kind of conglomerate company, and it was to be his, his, his assistant. And you know, I'm I'm in the interview and I'm saying everything, you know, and it, there weren't a lot of women in the menswear industry at the time. And then he finally said to me, "Well, do you take shorthand?" And I said, "Well, I take fast longhand." <laughs> and I got hired. So. You know, it goes back to, you know, the, the, the creativity of, you know, positioning yourself in a more unique way. And I was very fortunate early in my career to work for some really unusual talents in design. Uh, you mentioned Jeffrey Banks. He's my friend to this day. Uh, Willie Smith, if anybody remember Willie from the 80s, was probably the first African-American designer who really came to... Uh, prominence, but he believed that uh, fashion came from the street up, not couture down. So he was bastion of, of culture. He was the first designer to partner with artists like Keith Herring and Barbara Kruger, first designer to do a show at the Puck Building or set of fashion show, partnered with Max Vatical, uh, the director, and did a film on the Singalese National Ballet. And when you're, it was way before Target democratized fashion, where, you know, I think the learnings from that for me 
And the reason I actually never went into the true luxury business is I love this idea of aspirational accessibility and being able to touch a lot of people, um, but in a, in a way that has meaning to them. And then, you know, Willie was one of the first casualties of AIDS. Um, and you really saw the impact of that on culture and uh, how diversity was going to be so important in the future. So I was so fortunate to have these experiences every step of the way that it's never stopped. I've always been around finding the, the new idea of evolving a business. And I use the story, um, and now a lot of younger people don't know my reference, but if anyone saw the movie Working Girl, mm -hmm. right, there's a, there's a scene in Working Girl where Melanie Griffith has kind of been accused of not having the idea. And they say to her, well, tell us how you had the idea. And she said, well, Trask, radio. And she put these two disparate things together to create. I'm like the Trask radio girl, right? I, I like to not just see what's in front of me, but see what the could be. And I say that to people all the time, especially people who are going into, young people going into business. Don't just see what's in front of you. You know, take everything in from every area of culture and society and human behavior and then determine what is the what if. What can you envision? And you know, I always say to the people I work with, envision the ultimate possibility. It's not necessarily what we can get there tomorrow, but if that's what we're aiming for, it makes the journey that much clearer. And instead of people being incremental, they're going to look to have such greater impact if you give them that vision. So that, that, that's interesting. So speaking about a working girl and uh, bringing your idea to people in the fashion business and you work for some people who are very, very established, who are clearly visionaries, is that right? Were they perceptive to your ideas? I, I could only imagine they have also very strong personalities. How did that... So the, fir my, the, the first uh, 10 years or so I was in business, I was in sales. And it was early on when you were in sales in the fashion business, you also had an influence on the design and merchandising, et cetera. Um, but I always say I wasn't a great salesperson because I sold. I never sold. I anticipated what other people needed. And I try to really make, try to understand what it was that was going to motivate someone and what it was that they needed. And that's, to this day, that's how I look at relationships and human behavior. I never think of myself as selling anything. I think of how can I anticipate needs that maybe weren't being met or wasn't there. But to your point, when you work with very big personalities, I've been very fortunate. You know, I worked with Ralph Lauren, Tommy Hilfiger, Phil Knight, Barry Diller. Um, you know, I have the unbelievable, uh, you know, pleasure and honor to work with Oprah and the, and the board. Um, you know, it, it's no different. Uh, you know, anticipate, understand people, um, try and understand what motivates them. Try and get the best out of them that's going to help and support you. But at the same time, have a point of view. And at the same time, be able to articulate it. Because what you find is there's too many executives I've met who just want to surround them with people that are going to say yes or that aren't going to have the uncomfortable conversations. And I use with my team all the time, I want to be able to have productive discomfort. I want to be able to surround myself with people that will challenge me in a positive way because that's when the best is going to come out. Yeah. You, I, I think I noticed uh, in one of the interviews the lines about investment into hiring the right talent instead of using a lot of energy to try to resurrect marginal talent. Yeah, and you know, sometimes when that's phrased the wrong way, it comes out a little tough. <laughs> um, and really where it came from, it's interesting. I was in a meeting with Phil Knight at Nike, and 
you know, I'm very big on team building. I'm very big on teams working well together. I've worked with the same coach for 16 years. I believe that every day I want to be better or more insightful, and I want my teams to be more effective. And I was talking to Phil, and I said, Phil, I've tried so hard to get this individual you know, to move forward. And, and he said, Mindy, sometimes you have to take a step back and focus. Am I going to focus on making an ordinary person extraordinary, or am I going to surround myself with extraordinary people? And he goes, it doesn't mean you don't work hard to develop people, but sometimes you have to make the decisions. And he was right. Um, I am the biggest believer in investing in people, and I do. And whether that's investing in their uh, personal development, investing in giving them experience that are going to expand them. I mean, I've had people that have worked for me in three companies in a row. Uh, but at the same time, you have to recognize when something isn't working. And interestingly enough, I had dinner the other night with someone who was spectacular, who worked for me, who I, I actually fired. Um, and we're still good friends, and she's gone on. She just wasn't in the right role for her. And so you've got to be able to have those honest conversations. But my other philosophy is no matter what conversation you have, you never, ever let anybody walk out of a room feeling dehumanized or not motivated for the future. And that's really important to me. And now as you, as you uh, stepped into your new, newest role, so what did you see in Weight Watchers? Uh, because this is, this is a new line of businesses, a different industry. How did that come about? Yeah, it was really interesting. Um, so first, my Weight Watchers story. So I grew up on Long Island. And when I was 14 years old, my mother went to join Weight Watchers. My mom had a weight and health pro problem her entire life because she didn't take care of herself as much as she should have. Um, anyway, I was in that kind of adolescent phase, awkwardy, put on weight, and I wanted to be a cheerleader, but I didn't necessarily have the self-confidence, didn't feel. And anyway, I went to Weight Watchers. I lost weight, got more confidence, and I made cheerleading. So maybe this was fateful after all. <laughs> um, and when I talked in front of uh, my, the company for the first time, I actually resurrected my cheerleading picture for proof. Um, but uh, fast forward, you know, I'd been at my, my last company for about 10 years, and there was a president of HSN and a president, we also had uh, a division of six big catalog direct-to-consumer companies. Um, so I was spending a lot of my time on what was the next? How did we have to pivot? How did we stay relevant? Um, where was the consumer going? What companies should we be looking at? What businesses should we be looking at? Um, and in doing that, I was spending a lot of time around this idea of the companies of the future, and you'll relate to this, how does technology married to meaning, help people lead more connected, healthier, and more fulfilled lives. And I started speaking about it. I spoke in Dubai. I spoke in, in Vegas at conferences. And so I was spending a lot of time looking at the health and wellness uh, business, um, what I call the experiential hospitality business, um, and, and connected home, connected health. And October 2015, I had seen the news. I was watching CNBC that Oprah had joined as a board member and owned 10% of the company. But more so, it was the first time I heard this idea of the, the brand going from weight to wellness and having a more holistic connection within people's lives. And I, I wasn't even thinking, but it, it intrigued me. Um, and so as I was going through this journey, I was following what was happening at the, at the company. And you know, I was going to transition to chairman. The company was looking for uh, you know, a CEO. I was looking for a CEO inside or outside the company. Um, but in my heart, I knew I wanted to do kind of that one more big thing. And you know, my purpose filter, you know, what, did, what did I want? I said, not only do I want a business where I can certainly deliver a financial return on equity, but 
I want to do something where I can deliver a human return on equity. And that was so important to me at this point in my life. But I didn't want to necessarily go run a not-for-profit. I'm vice chairman of the US Fund for UNICEF, which is amazing. Um, and I wanted to do this combination of both. And, but I knew I didn't necessarily want to go into retail or fashion. So I started following what was happening with the company. And the more I did, the more intrigued I got at how powerful a partner we could be globally in people's lives um, to help them lead better lives. And you know, I was talking to a number of people today about this paradox that we're living in right now, because you have a world that's talking about this giant wellness economy of becoming close to $4 trillion. And everybody wants to think of themselves as a wellness company. And nobody wants to use the word diet. And private equity companies are looking to invest. And everybody's excited about the next $10 smoothie and $50 face mask. And, you know, and the world is getting unhealthier every day, every day. And you know, it's staggering to me now that I've been at the company and spent so much time with our chief scientific officer, the health community, the heart association, everything, saying, we have to solve this paradox. We have to solve this paradox. You know, if you look at the United States, 71% of the population is overweight or obese, and the trickle-down effect. Millennials, if we do not do something, are going to be the most overweight generation in history. And today's two-year-old, most likely, if we don't do anything, is going to be obese. So we may want to not talk about diet. Um, but the feeling is, if you ask a, a gener anyone, do you want to lead a healthier life? Do you want to be healthier? They're going to say yes. And what's the first question you ask them? Well, what's the first thing you think you need to do? 75% of people are going to say lose weight. So as much as we want to be a more holistic partner to people overall, we don't want to lose our legacy and heritage of having qualitatively and quantitatively the best weight loss program on the planet. So this idea to me of taking this 55-year-old company started by a young entrepreneurial woman bringing the best in how you eat to bring communities together to inspire each other. But now bring it into today, where because of technology, you can integrate so much more. You can personalize. You can literally, like what I like to say is, if you have Amazon for shopping, and Netflix for entertainment, and Spotify for music, we want to be that app that can be with you 24 hours a day and be your motivator, be your inspirer, be your educator, and have you be able to take control. That's what we're excited about, because the impact we think will be so significant, and it's so important. But we also know we can't do that alone. So how do we have the best partners who have knowledge in so many different areas, and how collectively can we deal with this paradox? And someone keeps asking, you know, uh, uh, somebody asked me the other day, OK, Mindy, you're with the company x amount of time. And you know, what, what would it mean to you to have, have impact? And I said, I, I, I want to be standing up with a group of people who we've all partnered together and be able to have something in a chart that says, collectively, we have changed the trajectory of people's health in the world in this way, and we see it being sustainable. So let me just ask you then one question. In particular, when it comes to weight control and dieting, even for us who are healthcare professionals, uh, many of us even get confused about the basics of what is right and what isn't right when it comes to dieting. It seems that every other year, there is another group of nutrients that are declared good at the expense of the group of nutrients that are declared bad, and then the cycle repeats itself every six to eight yeah. years. How, how do you stay relevant and not get trapped into kind of a fad diets and right. be, be kind of linked to, to so I'm going to use science? two examples. So actually, I have a slide in the presentation that we talk about this 
conundrum. And the slide has about two columns. There's about 18 sentences pulled from press or editorial. And everyone negates the other. Kale is good. Kale is bad. Yeah, yeah. Putin's this. Putin's that. People are so frozen and confused. And what we say, I have this expression, it's like the impotence of abundance. Right? You go in, if I go into Home Depot and I got to buy a light bulb and there's 9,000 light bulbs, I walk out without a light bulb because I'm <laughs> so overwhelmed. Well, this is what's happening today. People are so overwhelmed. So that's one, one, one part of it. The second is you have to really know what is livable, what is sustainable. You have to have the science behind it. And you have to be very clear what you are and what you're not. And there's a book by um, uh, Jason Kelly, interestingly enough, at Bloomberg, and it's called Sweat Equity. And it was the business of um, uh, fitness. And at the end of the book, uh, there's a private equity guy, and he tells a story, and he goes, OK, at the end of the day, there are cheeseburgers and there are cupcakes. You go into a small town, and there's like the best cheeseburger place. It's been there forever. Everybody wants the cheeseburger. And then every once in a while, there's the fad of everybody wants to be in the cupcake business. And then 10 cupcake shops open. And then at the end of the day, they go down. And maybe you still have some cupcakes. He said, in the fitness industry, yoga and running are cheeseburgers. <laughs> and you have all the cupcakes. So there I am talking to my organization. How oxymoronic for me to say, we're a cheeseburger. Yeah, yeah. We're not a cupcake. Um, but it really is true. Um, and if you ask anyone who's had their life uh, transformed, and by the way, if you talk to people who've been on Weight Watchers and have had that impact, the first thing they say to you is not that I lost weight. The first thing that someone says is my life was changed, how I feel about myself, how I'm there for my family, um, what this has meant to be. And the number one hashtag, for example, on Connect, which is kind of like our internal Facebook, Instagram, is hashtag NSV, non-scale victories. What has that meant? And there's always going to be fads. Um, but when we ask why Weight Watchers or why did you come back, they say two words. It works. And it works because of what the program is, and it works because of the support of the community. And now the third piece of that is how we can personalize it to make it that much more meaningful to you. Um, that, that's, what we, that's what we want to be. So when you take a look at such a rapidly changing area as, as yours, as ours, is that right? How do you create a company that can respond to the, to the needs of a rapidly changing environment in a way that is not only reactive, but it is proactive, to shape it more than to respond to it. What, I, what do you do as a CEO? Yeah. You know, I think it's the number one imperative today. And you know, I, I, I say, today, agile is the new smart. Um, so a couple of things. Number one, you have to build a culture where everyone is aligned. Everyone is collaborative. Everyone feels like innovation is part of their job, the days where it's not everybody has to feel that they're innovating. Part of it. Um, everybody has to understand that change is a daily occurrence, right? You have to have a long-term vision, our impact manifesto, and a strategy of what you have to do. But you have to be able to use agility and innovate within that framework. And everybody has to feel they're a part of it. Um, and that's why collaboration and culture are so important in today's world. You also have to build an organization of people who are eminently curious. And I like to say that for every person that we hire or have, I want to think that I'm actually hiring 10 people. Because if they're really curious, they probably are with people like themselves, and they're very connected, um, which means that network effect will have significance. And they're going to be thinking in a different way. Um, and then also, you have to build an organization of accountability. Um, so how do you innovate with accountability in mind? And you know, like John Doerr's book, Measure What Matters, and how you're going to do that. 
Uh, so it's a combination of, of all of those things. And you know, as a, as a CEO, you know, yes, my responsibility is to deliver for all stakeholders what has to be delivered, but my real responsibility is to service my consumer, my member, the most important person. And if I do the right thing, the financial will happen. If I do the right thing, and to have everybody motivated in service of that is what is so important, and that everybody feels that's a key element of their role. It's not just a job. And fortunately, we're, very pur we're a very purpose-driven organization. The people that are there feel that not only are they doing their job, but they are having an impact, just like everyone yeah. that works at the Cleveland Clinic every single day, they are having an impact on people's lives that are so profound. And what happens then is you have incredible dedication, you have a more diverse employee population, you have people who are you know, willing to think differently, strategically, and be more innovative because that's what they're accomplishing. And I think the part of the strategy is also something that you touched upon at the very beginning, and that's diversity. You know, you have been very successful yourself uh, uh, in, in a world that is traditionally man-dominated world. How do you go about diversity uh, in the workplace? So I've been very passionate and I've been speaking about diversity for 20 plus years. Um, created the first Women's Leadership Council at Nike, brought Catalyst in, did inclusion and diversity, changed hiring practices in companies where you couldn't even fill a position unless 50% of the candidate pool was diverse. And diversity is not just gender. Diversity is diversity of thought, experience. Um, you know, even when I look at how we're looking to diversify our member base, age, gender, race, ethnicity, geography, income level, life stage, very important. Um, you've got to embrace all those things. And what, what is so telling to me, and you know, if you do not embrace diversity, you are basically telling the world that you do not want to have the most successful company you can have. You do not want to attract the greatest talent that you can have. And if you are not diverse, if you are not purpose-driven, and really purpose-driven, because too many people think if they put a purpose on the wall, that's enough. You have to live it, you have to breathe it. It has to be so part of who you are. I think it's one of the most critical things that we need to live and breathe as a company. And so I use my platform. I speak on this every opportunity I can get. Uh, and the reality is that it's not just women that have to create the change. It's men. I mean, people who, you know, like you, are visionary and you act in a different way and you embrace diversity. You know, how do, how do we, as people who believe in this, hold other people accountable? Boards, CEOs, chairmen, uh, companies. And you know, it, it, you see what's happening in the world today. And, you know, I will read the paper every morning and there's another instance of, you know, something happening. And we want that to go away. And the only way it's going to go away if we embrace diversity. No, absolutely. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I, I would just like to ask you one, one last question and we'll open, open a podium to the, to the questions from the audience. It's going to be a hypothetical one because I can see how passionate you are uh, about the mission to democratize wellness, if I can steal one of, your, one of your favorite phrases. If you were to have limitless power <laughs> and authority. That would scare my husband to death. <laughs> And we protect your husband. <laughs> what, would you, what would you do to accomplish your vision in a more effective and faster manner? So I think it would be to galvanize different factions today that instead of looking at themselves as competing, 
in industries, that they come together and galvanize around one thing, the impact they're going to have on people's lives. And too many people, I think, talk out of two sides of their mouth. They say they want to do this, but they're not willing to either invest, they're not willing to create the type of change they need to change to do that, um, and not think about the end user in mind. So I'd wave a magic wand and get all of those people in the one room and say, we're one group that has to make this happen because we are talking about the future of humanity. Thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful ending. Thank you very much. So one, one thing that I do not want to do is to monopolize the stage. Uh, uh, so let's just open, uh, open it with the questions from the audience. I, have, I think we have someone over there in the microphone on the left side, our yes. left side. Hello, Dr. Mihaljevic. Hello, Ms. Grossman. We're very happy that you're here today. My name is Yvonne Weidman, and I work for the Tostig Institute, which is the Cancer Institute. Um, it's interesting, all the things that you said, they seem to hit something. And I just wanted to get an idea of how this factored into um, your development or what you know about it. So what role does emotional intelligence play, if any, in how you approach leadership and the team development within the Weight Watchers uh, organization. And another part of that is you talked about having to have difficult conversations with people. So what role does asking those challenging or probing follow-up questions play in obtaining a better understanding of your company culture and the employees' needs throughout the organization? That's a, that is a great question. And to your first point, I think that leadership today is very different than leadership in the past, which was more command and control. Today, I'm looking for people with equal IQ and EQ, people that can inspire others, people who are willing to be transparent, uh, people who are willing to be their whole self uh, at work, not, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer at that. Uh, I am who I am, and I'm willing to be as transparent and share as possible, uh, and willing to have you know, deep empathy. I think that's really important if you're going to understand people. Um, but to your other point, it's also critical to hold people accountable for what they need to do and what they've said they were going to do. And you have to be able to have those conversations as a group, and you have to be able to have them one-on-one. -on -one. And I also say to anyone who works for me, you have to be able to give me the tough commentary, because I'm not perfect, and I know what some of my, you know, you have a coach for 16 years, you know what you're good at, you know, you know. And, and at this point, I'm probably not going to change dramatically. I can modify. So you have to be willing to help me be better. Um, and those conversations just really have to exist, and they're really important. Uh, and you have to work with your teams to engender that kind of discussion, and you have to look to hire the people. Um, and you know, the more senior you get in an organization, uh, the more you can get isolated. You know, believe me, I've been in organizations where I've heard Mindy said, and I'm like, Mindy didn't mean that, right? <laughs> But because people have to, no, it's not just because Mindy said, it's because you believe in it too. And so you have to make sure you're surrounding yourself with those people who are equally invested in what needs to be happen. And you also have to have people around you, even if they're not the people who work for you, but you need to have a network of people who are going to tell you the truth, who are going to observe behavior, um, and who you can have an honest conversation with. Um, one comment and a question. My name is Heather. I'm a surgical nurse. I'm the single mom with two. Um, just wanted to say thank you. I, I am the product of Weight Watchers. I've been doing it for, since last January, and it's completely transformed my life. I, I can't say. <laughs> That is wonderful. I think I'm one of the biggest cheerleaders for Weight Watchers. I talk about it all the time, and it truly has given me my life back, so thank you. Um, my question is, I understand your mother was a particular inspiration for you. What advice has your mother given you through the years? 
You know, it's, it's interesting. So a couple of different things. And again, I, I just want to thank you for sharing that. It means more than you can imagine. Um, you know, one is that you can do anything you want to do and nobody can tell you otherwise. The second thing, which is a little bit more interesting, is there's a Yiddish expression that everything in life is beshert. And what it means is it's meant to be. And it's kind of like the movie Sliding Doors, right? Um, if something happens, don't regret it and don't look backwards. Always look forward. And I think because of that, I'm a look forward person. Uh, and, 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 and someone said, you know, what are those things you regret? And I go, I don't really regret. Sometimes I wish the outcome was a little better. <laughs> um, but you learn from, from all these things. And if you don't learn from them, that's a different story. But, you know, I've always been a glass half full person. I always look for the, the positive without being unrealistic. And that has really served me well. And it's made me not rue things or made me not overly dwell on things, but look for the forward and what have I learned and what I, what I can take. And I, I think those were, um, were definitely those, those things. Thank you very much. We have a question Hi. from the... Point. Hello, my name is Mary Beth. Thanks for coming to Cleveland and sharing yourself with us. I wanted to tell you one thing before I ask my questions. Um, I've been on and off Weight Watchers a long time, but the first time I joined, you couldn't have ketchup. You had to make your own ketchup. It was horrible. I loved, I loved ketchup, and I'm like, you're kidding me. So I had to share that. I mean, we're talking almost 50 years, so, but I thought that was interesting. Um, my question is, and this is, I think, really important to all of us. You've talked about the importance of human connection and community in losing weight. How does the people side help? Uh, you know, you mean the people side of people coming together, the, the human side. Part of it, oh, yeah. it's it's huge. You know, I, I I would say that community in today's world takes many forms, right? So I look at Connect, which is our digital community, which is one of the most profoundly positive environments I've ever seen in the history of you know my career. Then there is our community in the field. So we have 30,000 meetings a week, and we have 8,000 of the most amazing, talented, passionate, motivated human leaders and receptionists and people every single day who are looking to give back and inspire other people. And then the community of those individuals together. And I think the reason why our retention is at its highest in the company's history, is there are people who've achieved success, but they stay not only to hold themselves accountable, but they now want to inspire other people. And that's very meaningful. So my daughter, uh, who had a baby in uh, January 2017, um, you know, has lost a lot of her weight on Weight Watchers, and she's evangelical about it, and she, is where she wants to be. Um, and she posts every single day on Connect because she wants to share her experience with other people. And that is so profoundly positive. The third thing um, that we believe is going to be um, even more important is part of our goal is to also help underserved communities get healthier. And over the summer, we launched our first summer campaign in the company's history because people don't only want to get healthy in January, right? They want to get healthy all year round. So we launched a summer campaign around food, family, fun, and healthy. And as part of that, we had the first activation of WW Good. So WW Good is our social impact campaign around helping underserved communities get healthier. We launched a series of six wellness festivals in North America. Um, and at every one of those festivals, we take the largest park or trafficked area in the city. So in LA, it was Santa Monica Pier. Um, in New York on Sunday, we're taking over Union Square. And it's a full-on fitness festival. Holly Rillinger is the fitness expert. There's gratitude journaling. There's healthy cooking classes. Everything you can imagine, fresh food, et cetera. 
And it doesn't cost you anything to enter. You cross the threshold because you're doing something for yourself. And for every person that crosses the threshold, it unlocks a month's worth of fruits and vegetables for a family in the community that cannot afford it. It's awesome. The people that have come out and what we have learned and what we have observed tells us that people crave community and people crave the ability to help and inspire others. And so we are going to be uh, really looking to expand our reach globally. Um, we think these wellness events can bring community together, educate community, as well as support uh, other communities, and very important. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Hi, Mindy. I just wanted to thank you for sharing your story today. It's really been inspirational to me. Um, my name is Kristen. I'm a pharmacist here. And just speaking on behalf of a new professional, I was just wondering what questions would you ask a potential hire? No, no. I think that's uh, really important. So I, I talked a little bit about this before, but you know, I came out of the media business, you know, for 10 years, and everybody was talking about content, community, and commerce, the three C's, the three C's. So when we were thinking of how we hire, I was like, okay, let's think of three C's. I said, cool, curious, and connected. What I mean by cool, it has nothing to do with what you wear. It means that you are interesting. It means you have really done your homework. It means you've given thought as to, you know, why you're, you're here. Because I'm going to assume that by the time somebody gets into my conversation with me in an interview, their resume is great, right? I want to know who they are, what they care about, and not what, what, what homework have they done to say, this is why this interests me and I'm passionate. Um, are you curious, right? What things have you done outside of you know, maybe what your traditional background was. So let's say it's somebody that came out of the beauty business. Did you live your entire world in the beauty business or did you experience other things that could add value? Um, and then uh, are you connected? Like what do you do within your life to connect with other people? So I'm going to ask about the person. I'm going to ask about um, what's important to them. And I want to learn as much as, as possible. Um, and then one of the more important things, um, and I tell this a lot when I speak to young people, does the person believe in themselves? Because how, how you know, am, am I going to believe you if you don't believe in yourself? Um, you know, and it doesn't mean we all don't have insecurities. I have plenty. Um, but do I have the confidence to believe in what I'm doing and that purposeful aspect of it? That's what I think about. Thank you. Yeah, terrific. Thank you. Next question, please. Hello, Mindy. Uh, my name is Susan Briding, and I am I lead seven of those thirty thousand meetings that you are speaking of <laughs> <laughs> every week. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, my question is, uh, Oprah Winfrey plays uh, an important role in Weight Watchers as a client and part owner. Uh, what's it like to work with Oprah, and what do you see as her role going forward? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for being fantastic. I, every day I'm in awe of what people are accomplishing and how they're changing people's lives, so thank you for that. Um, you know, it's really an, it's been an honor um, to be uh, working with Oprah. Before I took the role, uh, I went out to California and I, I spent a day with her and we talked about what the potential was and we talked about what she saw and why she felt it was important to not just be in any way, shape or form a spokesperson for the company, but to be part of the company. She is an incredibly involved board member. She's a 10% shareholder. Um, but what I've really found is that I've had incredible accessibility. I've been able to text or call and say, you know, I'm thinking about something and I'd really like to run it by you. Um, Want to really get your thoughts. 
and she's very engaged. The other thing is, what have I learned from her? And there was an article in Wall Street Journal magazine about her, and there was a quote that one of her absolute strengths is that she practices ultimate discretion. She is very clear what not to do and what to do. And in doing so, it's very purposeful um, and what's going to be accomplished. And I think that that's been very important as I've gone through this journey. What are going to be those things that are going to have the greatest impact? What do we maybe have to stop doing, even if it's going to be change for people? Because we can now do so much more. Um, a great example of that is when we created our purpose filter. Um, we put everything we did through this purpose filter if we were really going to be a wellness company. And we realized that not all the products we made lived up to that. So we said we're going to get out of any products that we sell that have artificial sweeteners, ingredients, preservatives, et cetera. And it was a significant amount of the products. But we made the right decision for the brand and for the people we serve. Then we had to decide what the financial ramifications were going to be and how we were going to manage that. And the team came together. And in January, every single product that is going to be on the shelf in a meeting room, in our direct-to-consumer, and our now digital, is going to be all reformulated, or all new product, all new packaging with a different set of requirements. And we will now be able to do that much more and say we're going to own the healthy kitchen. And that's, that's kind of very Oprah-esque -esque thinking. And you know, she lives that. She breathes that. Um, she obviously is passionate about the business and where it makes sense for her, whether that's in a marketing campaign or in video series. Um, you know, she will be uh, utilized around those things that are very meaningful and important to her. Um, but again, it's been you know a great uh, honor, and you know I've been you know, really benefited by having her as part of the board. And it's a great board as a whole. Thank Terrific. you. Terrific. So we have time for two brief questions. So we're going to take one question from each side. OK. Hello. Thank you so much for being here and being so transparent. Um, Dr. Mihalovich, thank you for interviewing so well. Um, I'm a very passionate uh, bariatric staff physician here. And with Weight Watchers being the cheeseburger of, um, of weight loss programs, you've made my life a little bit easier. Um, I, I'm sure that a lot of people ask you all the time, you know, how is it so successful and why are you so successful compared to all the other programs? One thing I've noticed is that you have conquered an area that a lot of us have not, and that's access. You're everywhere and you have people on the ground, and you have really infiltrated the communities, and you have moved forward, not only in terms of you know, who your groups are, but also technology, so that it's not just being in person, but it's being virtually, and so on. And so my, my question is, have you given thought to the future, although you probably have, given what you've told us, you always look forward, um, given that Amazon, Jeff Bezos, is, has now taken on healthcare, and they have infiltrated very largely, and most likely are going to tap into obesity and weight management, and you know they're already selling products, and will most likely add the medical component to it. Has Weight Watchers given any thought to um, be, uh, leave the, um, not leave, but add to your, your grassroots approach and add in the medical component from a more individual aspect for your company. So it's, it's very interesting that you're speaking of that. So we have had and we have what we call our health solutions business. So that's more a B2B approach aligned in, uh, across business and to a degree across, let's call it healthcare. Um, but not to the degree that we can play such a much bigger role. So we're in the process, just like we're transforming 
and evolving our business to looking at that whole area of business for us and say, how do we have greater impact? How do we partner much more significantly so we can play a much bigger role? Uh, and I think over the, not think, over the course of the next year, I think you'll see a real evolution in that area of our business. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. So last question from the audience. Um, hi, Ellen Rome, pediatrician and adolescent medicine doc. Thank you for showing so clearly how the marriage of high EQ and high IQ can be transformative, not just in your industry, but in communities. So thank you for that. You use the phrase aspirational, uh, aspirational accountability. Given that children are our future and that wellness and health begin from birth, from preconception onward, what are your thoughts on how to uh, inspire and create and generate aspirational accountability in our ongoing pediatric and growing populations? Yeah, that's really interesting. And to your point, it's aspirational accountability and accessibility. Mm -hmm. uh, we do I'm know- sorry, aspirational accessibility. No, but both, both, yeah. absolutely both. And you know, just like we know, that you gotta help families. Yeah. You have to help families. And how do we get to the point where we're not fixing things that are broken, but we're educating it very early on? So what we have done, and I don't have the answer, we have formed a youth advisory board. We have 26 experts from seven different countries. And we're really trying to understand um, what is the opportunity and what role, or how can we help provide support to families, um, you know, and, and accessible support to families as, you know, we know that there's a need. Um, and we've already had uh, four meetings with that board, um, and we will continue to look at how we're going to play a role or at least play a supporting role in what we can do uh, within families. Awesome. Thank you. Well, Mindy, thank you very much for being here. Well, I can't thank you enough. This was truly an honor. And I can tell, you know, from the, from the second we met, we're both passionate about uh, the same thing. So it's really been fantastic. Well, thank you thank for you. sharing your passion and your insights and your wisdom. And please consider Cleveland Clinic as your home here in Cleveland. You're always welcome. Thank you. Thank I have you. to come back and see the new building. Absolutely. Us. Health Education Camp. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.